All right, what's going on, Rev Church? How's everybody doing? Say, yeah, buddy. Hey, man, it's good to see everybody here this weekend. If you're joining us online, we've had more people joining us online this weekend than we've ever had record attendance online. Amen. But if you're here live, do me a favor. Find somebody you don't know around you and just say, I'm glad you're here. Go ahead and say, I'm glad you're here. Go ahead. Now look at them and say, but don't touch me. Don't touch me. Hey, uh, when you came in, if you're here live with us, if you're online, uh, we'll hopefully be seeing you in the next few weeks at some point. Uh, you should have got a resource that was on your seat that says Supernatural Prayers. Hold that up real quick. That is yours to take home if you're here live. Uh, we will have a PDF to put online. Uh, but we're starting a new series next week that we planned uh, months ago, actually, called Supernatural Prayers. Uh, leading up to Easter, uh, we decided what we were going to do was going to do a church-wide fast for three weeks. What timing for a church-wide fast when the world is burning down around us. Amen, Rev Church. Like, what a great time for us to fast as a church, for focus and clarity, uh, for miracles and healing to take place in people's lives, and to pray for other people that are far from God and intercede for them. So make sure you take this home, uh, put it on your refrigerator, on the back of it, you will find the black part. Uh, it's got broken down uh, what our fast is, why three weeks before Easter, what's the purpose, what is fasting, a lot of confusion about fasting. During this three-week series, we're going to unpack exactly what fasting is uh, to make sure we clarify it. So if you're watching online, hopefully we'll see you live in the next few weeks, depending on what all happens uh, in our country and around the world. Uh, but make sure you pick one of these up next week if you're here. And if we're not together, uh, we'll all learn online. Amen, Rev Church. It will be good. Well, what a crazy couple of weeks it has been in our culture, especially up here on the plateau. Amen, y'all. Like tornadoes a couple weeks ago. Uh, man, this week, uh, we got to, let's just call a spade a spade and let's just be real. There's a pandemic running all over the world and uh, people are flipping out and going crazy. And uh, if you're not here with us because you decided to be at home, we get it. That is totally fine. But we're also glad that you're here live. Uh, we're not touching anything. We won't have an offering today. No offering buckets will be passed. But I just want to remind us of something before we get into the last week of uh, Relationship Goals, which is our marriage and relationship series that we've been doing. Um, in the Bible, there's a passage of Scripture that we hold to that's one of the most popular uh, passages of Scripture that there is. And if I could just read a short, short little part of it to you in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 6 through 7. Uh, if you're a Christian, if you're a disciple of Jesus, you put your trust in Him, you've been for, at church for any length of time, you know this Scripture, you kind of have it memorized or maybe totally have it memorized. Even if you're not a believer and you're joining us online, and by the way, share the link right now on your timeline if you're joining us online so more people watch. Because uh, people don't have anything to do right now. Amen. So they may listen to the gospel. Amen, y'all. Like, that'd be awesome. And so, but uh, you're probably going to recognize this, even if you're not a Christian and don't go to church. It says this, uh, chapter 4, verse 6, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God, and the peace of God, I don't know about y'all, but I think we could use a little peace right now. Anybody with me? Say Amen. A little bit of peace, more peace, less toilet paper, hashtag, okay? That's the next hashtag. The peace of God, if you went and bought toilet paper, it's cool, we love you, but the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I heard a story about a lady that had a thought that just tormented her mind, uh, worried her to death. For some reason, she just had in her head that at some point someone was going to break into her house and uh, come and steal the belongings that were in her house. And so for years, this woman would not sleep at night. She would worry. She would think, man, somebody is going to break into our house and, and they're going to steal and somebody's going to break in and burglarize our home. And, and years went by, years went by. She just kept having this thought. And finally, one night it happened. Someone broke into their house, to the downstairs of their house, and her husband gets up out of bed because they're upstairs, and he comes downstairs, and he finds a burglar that is broken in, and he says, oh, hold on just a second. I got to go get my wife. She's been waiting to meet you for years. 
the lesson is this. Anxiety, worry, and fear will steal a whole lot more than any thief could ever take from us. We have an enemy. He is referred to as a thief. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But the battle for us is in our minds. We serve the Lord with our minds. And when it comes to anxiety, when it comes to worry, when it comes to freaking out, I understand we have a brain and we're going to take precautions and, and I'm giving everybody some air guns today. Don't touch me, air guns. Shh, good you're here, you know what I mean? And, and we're not passing an offering and I get that. And we're hand sanitizing it up and we're cleaning everything extra here at the church. But at the same time, we cannot let anxiety, fear, and worry strip us from everything we're called to be as God's people. Amen, Rev Church? That needs to be a big amen. If you're watching online, it needs to be in all caps, amen, screaming out loud. We are not called as the people of God to freak out when the world is burning down around us. Actually, if you listen to the scripture that I just read, it essentially says that when the world is burning down around us, we're going to act completely different because we know we have a hope that other people don't have. We know that above all, we're not in control, but Jesus is in control of everything, and we trust him fully and completely, and that when we do that, the world will look at us, and they will say one of two things. Out of this is going to come one or two things. When this dies down in a few weeks or a few months, what's going to come is people are going to look at the church and they're going to say they were either crazier than anybody, they were nuts, or they're going to say those people acted totally different during that whole craziness. Man, they, they had a peace about them. They had a calm about them that really we don't even know where it came from, but we know it comes from the Lord. Amen, Rev Church? So if you're here this weekend, you're watching online this weekend, we're really glad you're with us. We're really glad you're here. I want to encourage you with something. If you believe that Jesus came to this earth, became a curse for you, died on the cross, and saved your soul so you don't have to go to hell, but you go to heaven, we need to act like people that have that hope. We need to be people that focus on things above and things not of this world, not the things in this world. I get it. Things are crazy. We'll use common sense. We use our brains, but we do not freak out and follow the ways of this world. Amen, Rev Church. That's good preaching, man, okay? Better than y'all are letting on. But I know, I know y'all are emotionally spent and mentally drained after the last couple of weeks. We had tornadoes a week ago, and now all this crazy stuff. Uh, you better be meditating on God's Word, and you better be med meditating on His promises, because I promise you, if you're meditating on CNN or Fox News, you're going to lose your mind. Amen? Just buy some stock in Charmin while you're at it. Amen, y'all. So, people always hold on to something material, something to try to get them through. I remember about 15 years ago, I was working at UPS in Knoxville, and there was a gas shortage. Everybody flipped out because the media said there was going to be a gas shortage, and people were buying gas up, and gas stations were out of gas. And so we were holding on to gasoline to get us through a crisis. Now... We're holding on to toilet paper to get us through a crisis. Again, if you bought toilet paper, I get it. I'm not judging. I'm just saying what we hold on to as Christians is, help me, church, Jesus. We hold on to Jesus, okay? If you're new to Rev Church, uh, you're joining us online for the first time because whatever got canceled and you're chilling out, hanging with us. We're in uh, week three of a series we've called Relationship Goals. And my prayer this week has been that through all the madness of what's gone on the last couple of weeks, we can take a little bit of a break and learn and hear about something and have some joy together in learning about relationship goals. Uh, hopefully, every single person in here, every single person joining us online, you have life goals. Uh, maybe those life goals include fitness goals or they include financial goals or you've got goals at your job to move up and get promoted. Uh, maybe you have goals as far as raising your kids. Hopefully you do. Hopefully you're doing the best you can to raise your kids. My question for us this weekend is what are our relationship goals? So many of us go into specifically marriage. This series is heavy on marriage, but you will see how it translates to every relationship you have. Uh, what are your marriage goals or what are your hashtag relationship goals? 
Uh, when it comes to the hashtag relationship goals, if you go on Instagram, you'll find that there are almost 15 million hashtags for relationship goals. I would tell you to be really careful when you're searching that because some of that stuff is pretty racy and pretty weird. But out of those 15 million of the ones I could look at, I gave my top three Instagram pictures that are hashtag relationship goals. And these are a little funny. Are y'all ready? Say amen. Yeah, come on, we're going to wake up, and we're gonna, it's going to be good today. we got Q&A at the end, and it's going to get awkward again, and it's going to be great. So here's my first one, my hashtag relationship goal that I really liked. Relationship goals. He kicks her in the face, and she's got a bloody nose. Next one's even better. See if your spouse loves you this much. Hashtag relationship goals. Wife steals cop car with husband cuffed inside. You love him that much? Come on, y'all. Come on, look at, your, look at your spouse right now and say, you love me that much, baby? Come on. And then the last one's my favorite. He's proposing with a slice of pizza. Amen, y'all. <laughs> Hashtag relationship goals. Pizza's going to help get us through this madness in our culture right now, right? Uh, maybe uh, your relationship goal should be something I saw on social media. If uh, our country goes into a quarantine for two weeks and everybody has to stay at home, your hashtag relationship goal is, I did not kill my husband or my wife. You know what I'm saying? Like, I think it was if I die in this two-week quarantine, it wasn't the coronavirus that killed me. It was my spouse, right? And so we all need to have relationship goals. It's been said that marriage is like eating with chopsticks. It looks easy until you try it. So what we're going to do today is we're going to go to the book of Genesis to one of the most popular, or I would say it's probably the most popular single verse of Scripture as it pertains to marriage that you'll find in the Bible. Jesus repeats it. It's repeated by Paul in the book of Ephesians, but I want to read it in its context to make sure we understand some of the things that are going along with it. Genesis chapter 2, this is the creation account. Adam has been made, and this is the account of when... Uh, God made Eve for Adam and with Adam. This is what it says in the B part of verse 20. Y'all with me? Say, I am. Look at your neighbor and say, come on. Yeah, you with me? Say, I am. Anytime I say look at your neighbor online, you do it online too, okay? We need y'all to be involved too. It says, but for Adam, no suitable helper was found. Everybody say the word helper. One, two, three. Helper. So the Lord God calls the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. And the man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. And then here's the scripture that we're going to focus on. And I've got seven points Seven relationship goals. Don't be going, oh, somebody went, oh, man, seven. Seven relationship goals from one single verse of Scripture. It says this, that is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. Let me read verse 25 too because it's important. Adam and his wife were both naked. Everybody say naked. I'm just seeing if y'all are awake. Okay. And they felt no shame. Genesis chapter 2, Matthew 19, 5, Ephesians 5, 31. You will find the verse that says, That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Seven relationship goals I want to give you out of this single verse of Scripture. You may want to write these down. You may want to punch them in your phone because I think they're going to come in handy for all of us. The first one is this. Listen to what the scripture says. That is why a man, everybody say a man, a man. Relationship goal number one is if you are going to get married and be successful in your relationships and in your marriage, you need to graduate from being a child to being an adult. It does not say a boy. It says a man. It does not say a girl. It says a woman, not a child, but a man an adult. This speaks to growing up. This speaks to maturity. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22, it says this, flee the evil desires of youth 
and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Growing up. Relationship goal number one, graduate from being a child to being an adult. Relationship goal number two, the scripture continues and it says, that is why a man leaves. Everybody say, leaves, leaves. Relationship goal number two is, you shift away from your former support system to your current marriage. One of the number one marriage assassins and relationship assassins that there are, and you'll know this, if I ever do pre-marriage counseling with you, I don't get to do it that much because I'm so busy, but I've got a care team that I've constructed that does some pre-marriage counseling. You'll hear me tell you this. One of the number one assassins for your marriage is what I call outside influences. I'll sit you down in pre-marriage counseling, and I'll say, when you get married, you leave mama and daddy. What I mean by that practically is when you have a fight with him or her, you don't go running home saying, they were so mean to me. They were so mean to me because when you go back and you make up with your spouse and everything's all good on your end, guess what your parents are sitting at home doing? They're not over it. They're sitting there stewing. They hurt my baby. You get rid of your former support system, not that you can't be friends, not that you can't love them, and you enter into your marriage, you leave your former support system. I would say this to the parents in here, that the greatest gift you could give your kids is to let them go. I heard a story about a man that was sitting at dinner with his wife one night, and he got a phone call and left the table and went and got the phone. You guys remember phones that actually had cords that connected to the wall? Does anybody still have one of those? I don't know. Yeah, not many of us, right? But he got up and went and talked, and his wife heard him, and and he was just talking and talking, and he came back, and she said, what was that? He said, well, that was our daughter. She said she was having a fight with her husband, and she wanted to come home. And the wife said, well, what would you tell her? He said, I told her she was home. She ain't coming back to this house, so you leave. You're gone. you got a new support system. Number three, y'all still with me? Say, I am. <laughs> For this reason, a man leaves. Don't miss this. His father and mother. Everybody say father and mother with me. One, two, three. Father and mother. Relationship goal number three is that we have godly examples to watch and learn from in our lives. The biblical way to do life and to structure the family and the hope would be is that every single person under the sound of my voice grew up in a household with a father and a mother that loved each other the way that Scripture says they're supposed to love each other. The reality of that is a very, very small percentage of us actually grew up in homes like this. When the Bible says you're to leave your father and mother, what it's talking about is when it says father and mother, a godly family unit is what you leave. The example that you've grown up seeing. Uh, the mentorship that you've seen that you are going to model in your marriage. What that means for us that didn't grow up with parents like this or in homes like this is we've got to make sure we have godly examples of couples that love each other the way the Bible says to love each other so that we can emulate them. Because don't forget this, we emulate the behavior of the people we are around the most. Amen, Rev Church? We emulate the behavior of the people that we are around the most. That's why if you were in here and you were thinking to yourself, hey, I'd really, I've got some financial goals in my life and I'd like to retire at 55 or early, you probably would not go to someone that's bankrupt three times to ask their advice on how to make money. Uh, if you wanted to be a tattoo artist, Guess what? There's not a tattoo parlor in the world that's going to say, just come on in and do the best you can. No, they have what's called an apprenticeship that you go through before you ever get to be a tattoo artist on your own. You go through this apprenticeship of learning from someone who is doing it right. 
If you want to be a preacher and be in ministry, uh, no, no church in their right mind would ever say, hey, we're going to stick you on the platform and let you lead a congregation. No, you start somewhere, and it's usually not preaching. It's usually not on the platform on Sunday mornings in front of someone. You find mentors. You find examples that you can emulate, and marriage is absolutely no different. We have got to have godly examples to watch and learn from in our lives. This is where the church comes in for us. This is why we have small groups. This is why we have men's ministry. This is why we have women's ministry. It's so some of us can break the bad habits and the things we've learned, and we can start to relearn and make new habits that are based off of what Scripture says. Number four, Scripture, let's read it one more time. It says this, That is why a man leaves his father and his mother and is united to, here's the fourth one. Everybody say, united, united. Relationship goal number four is, you never even consider giving up in your marriage. Let me say that one more time so the people in the back can hear it, so the people online can hear it. You never even consider giving up. That word united uh, comes from a really long Greek word that's restated in the King James Version as cleave. Uh, what the word picture for this word is, is glued or welded together. It speaks of permanence. A couple years ago, I was getting ready for a, a staff meeting, and I was getting ready to teach the staff about unity. And I was trying to build something that we were going to use together to try to draw something. Uh, but long story short, I don't need to explain to you what it was. I had some Gorilla Tape that I was trying to put some stuff together with. And I took a piece of Gorilla Tape and I stuck it on my lip. And I was going to use it in a second because I was using my hands. And so I took a piece off, put it on my lip. And, and then when I went to take that Gorilla Tape off, what do you think happened to my lip? It ripped all the skin off of my bottom lip. And I'm standing in staff meeting trying to teach the staff while my lip is pouring out blood. Listen to me. In a marriage, you are glued together. And I'm not judging. Some of us know this all too well. When it's ripped apart, it causes pain, and you're going to bleed everywhere. If you glue together two pieces of construction paper and you rip them apart, what happens? There's pieces of one piece of the paper on the other piece of paper. There's tears. There's rips everywhere. You are united. I want you to remember that in this story of creation after he created Adam and Eve, they were doing great until... Satan talked one of them into getting away from their spouse. When Eve was away, that's when she was vulnerable. We are united. We never even consider giving up. Number five, y'all still with me? Say, I am. It says, his wife. Let me reread the scripture one more time. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife. Everybody say, wife. This is a compliment to him. Uh, because it comes from his side, this is, in a way, completing him. Relationship goal number five, recognize your spouse as your helper. Uh, in verse 18 that we read just a second ago, it said, The Lord God said, It is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Everybody say the word helper. Helper. Ladies, did you know that the word for helper that's used in the Hebrews here in verse 18 is the exact same Hebrew word that's used in Psalm chapter 46 to describe God himself? Now, I'm not saying you're God, but I'm saying you need to think about how we complete each other. Men, you are helpers to your wives. Ladies, you are helpers to your husband. I remember a story I heard about a uh, guy who got his, uh, what is it, a... Uh, his buggy, his horse buggy, Amish guy, got his horse buggy stuck on the side of the road and one of his wheels got stuck in some mud and he only had one horse named Bubba that was hooked up 
uh, to his carriage, and it was stuck. And so a guy in a pickup truck pulled over and said, hey, man, do you need me to pull you out? And he said, no, man, my horse Bubba, he's blind and he's old, but he can, pour the, he can pull this thing out. Even though he can't see and he's kind of old. And so the guy said, okay. He said, I'll hang around to make sure you can get it out. And so the Amish man gets out, and he says, Bubba, Steve, Dave, we're going to pull this buggy out, okay, guys? And he says, come on, Dave, pull it out. Bubba just sat there. Come on, Steve, pull it out. Bubba just sat there, third time. Come on, Bubba, pull it out. Bubba rears up, man. He pulls that carriage right out. Guy that stopped on the side of the road said, man, why did you talk about Steve and the other horses there? He said, well, my horse is blind. So if he thinks there's two other horses helping him, when I tell him to pull, he'll pull that sucker right out because he thinks he's got two other people pulling with him. The point is this. In a marriage, it takes team work. You are a complement to each other and you are a team. You are helpers to each other. Matthew Henry in his commentary wrote this. Woman was not taken from man's head to be above him. She was not taken from man's foot to be walked on by him. But she was taken from his side to be equal to him. From under his arm to be protected by him and near to his heart to be loved by him. Relationship goal number six. That was number five. Number six. Y'all ready for the last two? Say, I am. Number six is learn how to love and build trust with your wife and your husband. The next two words in this scripture say that a husband and wife become. They become. What that means is you're learning how to love your spouse the way they need to be loved. You're learning how to build trust with your wife and husband. And the context suggests that it's not an immediate thing that happens when you say, I do. The context suggests it takes time and it takes effort. That's what becoming is. What this means for us is when you get married, you never stop dating. You never stop pursuing. You never stop learning about your spouse. I was talking to uh, Brooke, who's our worship leader, my wife. She's going to be up here in just a second to do some uh, live Q&A with me about uh, the band. And I was asking her, you know, how, how, much, uh, how long does it take for you guys to get good when you play together? Like when you guys get together, like do you really need to practice or do you just, you know, can y'all wing it and y'all are good enough? And she said, Josh, you don't understand. I mean, the band is, they've always crushed it on Sundays. I don't think I've ever been here on a Sunday where the band hadn't crushed it. Amen, Rapture. They are crushing it. Our worship team is incredible. It's incredible. If you're watching on live, we know you want to see it, but you've got to be here live to see it, okay? That's our hook for you to come live. But, uh, but she said, you don't know how many times we've walked away from practice on Thursday nights, and it has sounded like a train wreck. She said, you don't understand how we've run through the songs on Sunday mornings. They get here at like 7.30, an hour and a half before everybody else gets here, and they run through the songs. And we walk away from that practice thinking, man, it's going to have to be a miracle today because we sound terrible. It always comes together at the end, but if we didn't practice, it would sound absolutely horrible. Same thing in a marriage. It's like when you get a guitar, a bass, drums, and three singers and a piano playing together. they got to practice in order to be good. Same thing in a marriage. you got to practice. you got to date each other. you got to pursue each other. you got to learn each other in order to make that beautiful, beautiful music. Amen, Rev Church. Last relationship goal is this. I'm doing pretty good on time, man. I'm doing okay. we got 10 minutes left. Say, yeah, buddy. Here we go. If we go over today, make sure you thank your... Uh, children's workers. Nobody's got anywhere to be, right? So it's all good. So, Last one says this at the end of the scripture. Let me just reread the scripture real quick. That is why a man leaves his father and his mother and is united to his wife. And they become, what are those last two words? One flesh. Let's all say that together. One, two, three. One flesh. This speaks to intimacy between a husband and a wife. Relationship goal number seven. Ultimate togetherness through the power of Christ. Last verse we read at the beginning of this sermon, in the next verse, verse 25, it says, Adam and his wife were both naked 
And then here's the key to ultimate togetherness, to ultimate intimacy. And this is the goal in a marriage. They felt no shame. More than physical, this would be termed psychological vulnerability between two people. A trust to be completely themselves and hide nothing from each other without fear of reprimand, without fear of any type of negative negativity. Ultimate togetherness. I remind you too, Adam and Eve, as far as we know, enjoyed this ultimate togetherness by the power of God until sin entered the picture and caused all kinds of problems. We're going to go to our Q&A portion now. Y'all ready? Say, yep. Yep, I think we got some help. My wife, Brooke, my bride, Brooke, is going to come up and help us out. My boy, Cannon's going to help me out by getting our little table up here. What's up, buddy? Doing good? Go get the table. It's right over there. Give Cannon and them a hand, y'all. So I got to brag on our students real quick. Um, our students, how, how, how many of you guys have enjoyed the Q&A portion of this series? Just raise your hand. Everybody's been telling me, like, don't preach, Josh. Just do questions and answers the whole time. It's, it's awesome, but give Cannon a hand for helping us out, man. It's pretty awesome. So our students are absolutely blowing up right now. They're just killing it. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but Brandon's got 80 to 100 students coming on Wednesday nights. And they're, they're not just coming on Wednesdays. They're coming on Sundays and serving and jumping in. And we just think that's incredible. Amen, Rev Church. But if you're new to Rev Church, you're watching us online for the first time, what we've done during this series, and this is the last week of this Relationship Goal series, is we recognize when we started it, I recognized that there's no way I was going to be able to answer every single question that would come into the people's minds. Uh, there are so many different backgrounds represented at Rev Church. Uh, there's single people in here. There's divorced people in here. There's uh, people that have been married for 50 years. There's people that have been married for six months. There's all kinds of different backgrounds, all kinds of different baggage and questions that would come up during this series. We know we can't answer them in three weeks. And so we set up a text message line for you to text in the questions you want to text in and every single week we've been doing three to five different questions and uh, it's probably been the funnest part hadn't it and uh, I hadn't gotten any trouble yet have I not, not yet. yet yeah not yet you got to talk into the mic there's still time yeah, yeah so yeah we may let's make sure her mic's on testing yeah, yeah right. let's give God a hand the mic's working <laughs> but uh, we're going to answer three questions today and uh, once again these are some doozies. How many of y'all were here last week? Raise your hand. Got a little awkward up in here, didn't it? So I had a lot of fun, though, a lot of questions. Just go back online and watch it uh, if you weren't here for the last two weeks. If anything, fast forward to the last 15 minutes for the Q&A portion because it was really, really good. You ready for this I'm one? I'm ready. Let's ready go. Ready for the first one? Let's do this. You want to get it done, huh? Yeah. It's our last service. If I don't get in trouble in this one, I'm doing great, y'all. Y'all promise to pray for me right now. First question is this, and it is a great one. Really, really good one. Put it up on the screen. You want to read that one? What is the correct way to argue? All right, you ready? <laughs> I'll go first. So I feel like when we first got married, I resorted to what I saw as a kid. Um, you know, it was like your first education of seeing people argue. So if you saw people yelling when you were a kid, you probably yell. If you saw people you know, giving silent treatment, you probably give the silent treatment. So I would say that these are the things we don't do, okay? Number one, yell, scream, and as my kids hit and punch and push each other, um, because that's, that's what, you know, we feel like doing, but we can't do what we feel like doing. Um, the verse that I had for this is uh, 1 Corinthians 3.11. When I was a child, I thought like a child and I reasoned like a child. But when I grew up, I put away childish things. So I would say calm down and be still. Get, get control of yourself. Self-control, number one. Um, number two, the thing that we saw probably other people do is storm off. Anybody ever done that before? <laughs> Um, ha actually try to have the conversation. Don't, don't bail on the conversation. Yep. Um, number three, I said the silent treatment earlier. Um, use wisdom with your words and say, I'm sorry. Mm. And this is such a good question. Because if we get quarantined across the nation, you're going to be stuck in your house with your kids and your spouses. So listen right now. Take notes. So. And number four, maybe your human nature is just to pretend that nothing's wrong. 
Um, I've seen this a lot. I talk to a lot of ladies who they say, oh, I'm just not going to say anything. I think that's the worst thing we can, one of the worst things. We need to figure out what's wrong and we need to voice it. And I think the longer that we've been married, I've learned that usually what we're arguing about is not really what I'm upset about. I'm tired. I'm stressed. I'm hangry, you know. <laughs> Y'all. And I just, I'm taking it out. No, no, hold on. If it is hot in the room, she flips out, or if she's hungry, just stay away. Any, you guys in here know what I'm talking about? Say amen. Yeah. See, I'm not the only one. Yeah. I'm not the only one. Yeah. So usually, you know, you need to just identify what it is that you're upset about. Maybe you're not upset with them at all. Did you turn the air up? I'm going to kill you. Yeah, go ahead. So, yeah. <laughs> no, it's the other way. Oh, yeah. Up. Okay. Um, manipulate. You want to argue? Yeah. Let's, <laughs> Cause I'm let's just demonstrate here. Um, manipulate or be petty. Um, the only goal in arguing should be to resolve and to change yeah. the situation. And I mean, we've been married for 20 years and we still act petty sometimes. And it's just so stupid. We'll mock each other or, you know, just act like little eight year olds. Yep. I don't, I don't know why. That's good. Oh, but the quote that I wanted to leave you with was, I saw this the other day on Facebook, but it's great. Speak to people in a way that if they died tomorrow, you would be satisfied with the last thing that you said to them. That's good. That's good. I would say, number one, recognize that you're going to fight. Any relationship that's worth having is going to be real, and you're going to argue. So you need to be concerned about a relationship that acts all lovey-dovey, but everything's perfect. When I do pre-marriage counseling... And couples come in acting all stupid, you know. They're like in the honeymoon phase, and they're just like, we love each other so much. We never argue. My number one goal is to make them almost kill each other before premarriage counseling. So none of y'all are going to ask me to do it now because I want to see how they interact when they fight. Have you thought about this? Have you thought, I know you think he's great now, but he's going to do something really stupid really soon. Amen, ladies? And, like, you're going to have to deal with that. So that's a little too loud, amen. But, um, <laughs> but you're going to fight, and so just accept it. Uh, we got some bad marriage advice when we first got married. Somebody said, several people, like, don't go to bed angry. We didn't sleep for a whole month, y'all. So just know it's going to happen. Um, when you're wrong, admit it. When you're right, shut up. Um, I would say do these things. And then don't do some things I'll mention in a minute. Do listen. And do be careful with your words. Ask yourself these questions. Should it be said, should it be said right now? Uh, we talked about this when we talked about gossip. I preached on gossip. Everything you say should be true, but not everything that's true should be said. Okay, let me repeat that. Everything you say should be true, but not everything that's true should be said. In other words, when you're wrong, admit it. When you're right, you don't always have to say something. Um, Make sure you have a way to handle your anger in the right way because you will get angry. So do those things. Don't do these things. Don't call names. Don't let your emotions control you as hard as that is. Don't raise your voice. Don't, for whatever reason, bring up the past because that's stuff that's supposed to be in the past. East from the West is the example. Don't exaggerate. Uh, don't use the words never or always. That's emotions. That's exaggeration. Never threaten divorce, and then probably most importantly, never, ever, ever quote your pastor to win an argument. Uh, Craig Groeschel wrote a great book called From This Day Forward. It would be great for you guys to pick up and read, whether you're single, married, whatever. And he says, four signs that you're not fighting fair are this. Number one, you criticize. You never do this. You never do this. You never do this. Number two, you have contempt for the other person. Uh, you're rolling your eyes, your sarcasm, uh, you're mocking, like she said. Uh, we've, we've done that before, haven't we? Why don't you pick up the socks? Why don't you pick up the socks? Why don't you pick up the socks? Uh, number three, you're defensive. It's not me. It's all you. Number four, stonewalling. That's the silent treatment, and that's ignoring. A lot of men resort to that, okay? So uh, don't do those four things. And when all else fails, guys, when you're having a fight, just look deep into her eyes and hold her arms so she can't hit you with them, okay? So, uh, good on that one? Good, good Rev Church, say amen. Okay, second one is this. This is a really good one, and this is exactly how this came in. We got it in a couple different ways, but I wanted to put it this way because it's such a good way to put it. Where should the church rank in life priorities? 
i.e., is it a good idea to be at church volunteering and such more often than spending quality time with your family? Great question. Amen, Rev Church? Like, really, really good one. So, I think that if you ask the families that serve together if it's quality time for them to serve, I think they would say yes. Um, I see people all the time, um, you know, couples serving together. Uh, the kid might not be right with them, but somewhere else in the church serving or something like that. And it just brings such a joy to the family. Serving should be a part of life. It should be quality time. I can't tell you just like our family. I mean, our kids wake up every single day. Is it church day? Is it church day? Is it church day? They love being here. They love serving. We've created a culture of serving in our family. So I think the answer to this question is serving is quality time. Um, I, I think this, here's the baggage on this and probably the background that this comes from. And most of us can totally identify from what I'm getting ready to explain. The church in America in the past has always equated involvement in church with holiness. The more you do at church, the better disciple you are. And so many of us come from a background where we got burnt out, and this will sound familiar to some of you. You woke up on Sunday when you were a kid, and your parents made you get up and go to Sunday school. Then you went to Sunday worship. And then you had to go back Sunday night for Sunday night Bible study. Well, then you had to go back on Monday or Tuesday for visitation. And then you had to go back for a board meeting and hang out at the church while your parents were at a board meeting on some kind of committee or something like that. And then Wednesday night, there was another prayer meeting and Bible study. And then there was youth. And then Thursday night, there was a potluck that took place. And every single week, it was programs, programs, programs. We come from this program-driven mindset that the church in America has had where we've equated that. And, and quite honestly, the church made you feel bad if you didn't come to every single thing. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Say amen. Okay, if you don't come to everything, then you're a heathen and you're going to bust hell wide open. You know what I mean? And at this church, what we've recognized is it's about quality, not quantity. And so just so you know this, we've got internal internal, how can I put it, protection policies that are in place at Revolution because we recognized about two or three years in that when people served in too many places, it wasn't long before they were burnt out and they left the church. And so if you ever come to us and say, I want to lead a group, I want to sing in the band, and I want to help in kids' ministry, we're going to say, no, you're not. You're going to pick one of those three because we want you to be healthy. Um, I would totally agree with you that serving together in church uh, should be quality time. Uh, I think so many of us uh, come from a place where church is not as it's defined in Scripture. Church is a gathering. Uh, we just went through the seven uh, churches in Revelation. And so uh, you know that it's called the ecclesia or the called out ones, the gathering. Uh, church is a place where you get encouragement, accountability, love, focus, and clarity. Uh, you get hope. Like this week, we're all coming together. We're laughing, going through the Bible together. You guys are full of joy right now. You're going to be f full of way more joy right now than you were the rest of the week. I promise you that because of all the craziness that's going on around us in our lives and in our culture. Uh, it's a place we come for community and support. Um, so I've got these two statements written down. Church is not an institution you attend. It is a family you're a part of. Let me say that one more time because some of y'all have never experienced this. Church is not an institution you attend. It is a family you're a part of. If you've never experienced that, I would encourage you find a good church and jump in with both feet. Start serving with your family. Get involved in small groups. Don't just come to church. Be the church together. Second thing I have written down is church is not an organization you volunteer at, church is a gathering you change the world with. Uh, there's two ways to have perspective about volunteering at church. Um, you can come in and say, man, we got to get this over with. we got to get this done. Uh, man, I, and I totally get that, guys. I mean, I get it. Last week, we had a record attendance and kids. There was over 100 kids in one service last week. They had 15 babies in the nursery last week in one service. Everybody go, what? I couldn't do it, y'all. I'd go crazy, you know what I mean? But if you wake up just viewing that as i got to get this over with versus I'm changing the world, like I'm changing the world 
by my serve. It's two different ways. Can I to add there. to that too? Like if you haven't taken that step and you're, you haven't jumped in to serve, I want to remind you that the enemy will not like it. And the morning's going to be bad the night before. Somebody's going to get sick. Like everything is going to happen yep. to make you not do it. Yep. Things are going to come up in your life. And the first thing you feel like you need to drop is that serving. But I'm telling you, that is where the joy comes from. So just. And the other thing is it's going to get you out of your comfort zone. You've been used to coming and just sitting at church. All of a sudden, you start volunteering, and it's like, whoa, kids really do have dirty diapers. And whoa, people really are crazy until you're number one when you're on the parking lot team and, you know, outside. So y'all awake? Say amen. Okay. So, uh, you know, so yeah, jump in. Jump in with both feet. And we're going to make an announcement when we're done with these questions. We need you to jump in, okay, because we're going to three services. I'll tell you more about that in a minute. Last question is this, and this is a great question right here. Uh, a lot, of, a lot of baggage with this question, a lot of hurt with this question, but we're going to do the best we can to be sensitive to this. Uh, is it possible? We got this in a few different ways, but I tried to put it in the way that's the most blunt uh, because we just need to be real with this question and uh, say what it is. Is it possible for a marriage to be fixed after adultery takes place? I think yes, but not without God. Because with God, all things are possible. And we even sang this morning, um, Psalms 147.3, He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. And healing does not just happen. It, it's a process. So, yes, I believe it can happen through a process. Um, it will take commitment. It will take to support from each other, and it won't be easy, but I believe marriage is worth it, and God believes marriage is worth it. And let me leave you with a quote before he answers. Ruth Graham, who is Billy Graham's wife, she says that marriage is just the union of two good forgivers. Yeah. Um, I would say that specifically with adultery, it's so hard because... And I, I've never experienced this, so I'm not trying to say I can relate to anybody that's been through this, so please don't let me offend you. But uh, the people I've counseled with and walked with through these things, uh, you know, it just breaks so much trust in a relationship. And so I would tell the people in here right now that are married and you have trust in your marriage, you better never do anything to tarnish that trust. You better hold that trust close and you better do everything you can to protect the trust you have because the more trust is broken, the more time it takes to build it back. And uh, adultery is one of those things that takes the most time. I would caution everyone, just by way of preface before I answer in, that most of the time when I see adultery take place between couples, um, it happens because marriages go through seasons just like everything in life does. And so you go through one season where you feel that all your needs are being met by your spouse. Well, then something happens. They get sick. You have kids. They change jobs, whatever. And all of a sudden, your needs aren't being met the way you want them to be met. And what the enemy typically does in those situations is he'll bring a third party in that makes you feel like the needs that used to get met by your spouse are now being met by that person. And then it's just baby steps to doing something uh, that's really, really stupid. I would say this. Here's three, three uh, practical ways for people that are married right now that haven't had that trust broken and adultery take place. Number one, never be alone with someone of the opposite sex that's not your spouse. We have a rule here at the church that we're never alone with anybody of the opposite sex that's not our spouse if we're married. Uh, ladies, if you're in here and you're broke down on the side of the road and Pastor Josh drives by and recognizes you, I'll stop. I'll give you the keys to my car and say, you can leave. I'll wait here with your car and call somebody to come tow your car away. But I'm not going to say, hey, can I give you a ride anywhere uh, for the perception of it and also because you never want to give the devil a foothold. Number two, never message old boyfriends or girlfriends or people that you've ever been romantically involved in. They shouldn't be your friends on Facebook. Uh, you can try to justify it in any way, shape, or form, but that's not good in any way, shape, or form. If you struggle with this, you need to get off social media, in fact. Uh, number three, remember everyone is messed up and has flaws. So when you're thinking that the person that is meeting those needs that your spouse couldn't meet or used to meet or they're not meeting them anymore, and you meet that new person, that secretary, that person that you're running into at the gym that seems like they would meet those needs, I want you to remember this quote. 
if the grass is greener on the other side, it's because there is a septic tank leak somewhere. Everybody with me? Say amen. Amen. There's doo-doo somewhere in that lawn. So be careful. Um, If your marriage or a marriage that has had adultery take place, I think you need to go through what I would describe as the healing process. Uh, And this goes for if you are still with the person that cheated on you, or this goes for if you've divorced that person and you've moved on, you still need to go through the healing process that includes a couple things. Number one, forgiveness. Um, Anger, bitterness, hatred that you store up inside you will kill you emotionally. And not only emotionally, it's been proven by scientific studies that it will kill you physically as well. So you have got to forgive. Uh, Forgiveness does not mean that adultery is okay. Forgiveness does not give your spouse a pass to go and do it again. Uh, Forgiveness is a choice and it is a process. And what forgiveness does is it frees you from the emotional bondage of the hatred and bitterness that you can have stored up inside you. Uh, I wrote this down. The one who is hurt must be willing to forgive to truly heal. You'll never heal until you forgive. Uh, you got to remember this too, secondly, in the healing process, that it's all about building trust back. And that doesn't happen instantaneously. Uh, for the spouse that had an affair, there's a few tips I would give you if you're the one that messed up and did something stupid and sinful. Uh, You've got to be honest, and you've got to be truthful, and you've got to provide whatever information they want in order to start to build that foundation of trust back. Uh, You've got to be willing to uh, do whatever changes they want you to do if you messed up. If you've got to put a GPS tracker on your phone because they want to know where you are at all times, you've got to be willing to do that. Um, I've got seven things for the spouse that messed up. These are things that I think you need to do. It's usually good to ask the question, what can I do to help build trust back? If we were counseling, these are things that I would tell you to do. Is everybody still with me? Say, I am. Um, So number one, if you're the one that messed up, you cheated on your wife, you cheated on your husband, number one, you need to repent. You need to repent to God. You need to repent to your spouse. Number two, you need to show remorse. Because if there is no remorse, there is no repentance. In other words, don't be defensive and just accept what you did was wrong. Don't try to justify it in any way. Number three, you need to be accountable with your time. Uh, The spouse that's been hurt is going to do everything they can to make sure they don't get hurt like that again. And probably one of those things is they're going to want to know where you're at every single moment of the day, and you need to just tell them. You need to just let them know. Be accountable with your time. Number four, cut off all contact with the person and the social circle that the person you had the affair with is in. Cut it off. It may mean quitting your job. It may mean moving. I don't know, but you've got to get rid of it. Y'all with me? Say, I am. It's hard stuff to talk about. Number five, answer questions and be honest. Now, I would say this, that if you've been hurt, be careful with the questions you ask because sometimes too much information is not helpful. But whatever they ask, you be honest. Number six, find accountability outside your marriage. This is where the church comes in. Let me put it to you like this. If you've screwed up, you need to have someone in your life beside your spouse that's willing to punch you in the face and say you're getting ready to do it again. Quit being an idiot. Does that make sense to everybody? Say amen. Amen. You need to find accountability. You need a men's group. You need the women's group. You need people in your life that love you enough to tell you that. And number seven, of course, you pray and you let God work a miracle. For the spouse that's been hurt, I would say uh, uh, be careful when you're asking questions. Too much information is not good. Number two, celebrate the wins with your spouse. When they're doing good, don't let the enemy come in and remind you of everything in the past. Uh, Celebrate the wins when your spouse is complying to all your needs to make sure you're not hurt. Number three, recognize you're not responsible for his or her decisions. Uh, Don't blame yourself for it. Let me say that again for the people in the back to hear. Don't blame yourself for it. Everybody listening, say amen. Amen. Ladies in here, don't blame yourself for it. Say amen. amen. Okay, it's not because, you know, you had two babies and you gained 40 pounds that he did it. 
He's an idiot. That's why he did it, okay? He messed up. And there is forgiveness in that. There is redemption in that. But never blame yourself for that. Number four, pray and let God work a miracle in your marriage. You got anything you want to add to that? Fair enough, Rev Church. Say amen. I want to let you guys know this, that we do have, uh, I've got a care team that I've put together because I'm so busy. I run around like a chicken with my head cut off and everybody wants to counsel with me and talk with me. But I've got a couple of couples that have way more wisdom than I do. They're much better counselors than me because if you've ever talked to me, one of my weaknesses is listening. Anybody know that? You talk to me on a Sunday morning and I go, oh yeah, and I walk out right in the middle of a conversation. These people are very good listeners. They're very good counselors. So if you need, uh, obviously, we can't answer these questions questions and find, give healing and those types of things in 10 minutes or five minutes. And so if you need further, uh, further counseling, uh, further help, then uh, contact my assistant. She'll hook you up with one of them or the church. And so let's pray. Lord, we love you. We thank you so much for today. I thank you for every single person that is here, God. I thank you for every single relationship that is represented in this place. Uh, God, I just pray that our relationship goals line up uh, with what you would have for our marriages, for the relationships we have with our kids, for the relationships we have uh, with the people in our lives. Uh, God, I just pray for protection over the family units that are represented in this place. We pray you be with us and that you lead us and guide us. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, amen. Amen. Y'all still with us? Amen. Okay, good deal. Hey, we're not taking an offering up today because uh, we don't want to pass the buckets and get... Everybody's grimy hands all over it, you know, anybody to freak out. But I've got a couple of announcements for you guys to give that are really, really important. We're drinking from a fire hydrant this weekend at Rev Church. There's so much going on. The first one is, as you've noticed when you came in, the expansion work has started next door. We are expanding the kids' space. We're going to have a coffee shop. Our goal is that on March 29th, we are going to launch that expansion space. It won't affect us in here, but it will affect the kids' ministry. Um, So we've got some classrooms that are being split because there's too many kids in it. Uh, We've got uh, Club 45, which is going to be fourth and fifth graders, that's going to have a brand new classroom over here in the expansion space. If you have a fourth and fifth grader, you'll drop them off over there, pick them up over there. Uh, We're going to have a new pre-K room uh, that's going to be in the expansion space where they'll have it split between a playroom and a classroom, which will help them out. It's going to be way bigger than the room they have now. Also, the nursery is expanding. Uh, We're tearing the wall down in between the nursery and pre-K room. It's going to be about three times as big. And uh, you'll drop your babies off at the same place, but we're going to split them up between... When you have 15 babies and seven of them are barely walking around like crazy and the others are crawling and can't, it's kind of dangerous, so we're going to split them up by that. And uh, as a result of all this, we need you to volunteer. So if you're not volunteering, we need you to volunteer because... We've been so packed out, and we made this decision before all the coronavirus stuff, so we'll see how it goes, but we've been so packed out here recently at Rev Church, really since Christmas, uh, that we, we, we see and we recognize that we have a need to go to a third service. So on Easter weekend, we are going to a third service. We're going to add a third service on Sunday mornings because how many of y'all have been here lately and seen it packed out? Raise your hand. I mean, we're putting extra chairs out, standing room only. Uh, Last week in the second service, this service, they had almost 100 kids in the kids' ministry. Amen, y'all. Isn't that awesome? Isn't this good news? Come on, that's really good news. It's good news till all the volunteers quit because they're losing their mind. Amen, y'all. And so, um, so we need some more volunteers. We're going to be going to three services on Easter, and we'll be starting that and keeping that uh, through. Hopefully, we'll be through all this craziness in our culture by then, and uh, we'll be packed out again and rocking and rolling. So I'm going to pray, and uh, then you guys will be dismissed. Been a good day, Rev Church. Amen. Everybody, everybody awake? Amen. You don't have anywhere to be. I know you ain't going out to eat, so we're not in a rush, right? So, Lord, we love you. Thank you for today. Thank you for every single person that is here. And, God, right now we just lift up our nation to you and the world to you. Uh, Lord, in the midst of this craziness where there is what they've called a pandemic that is running wild in the world, there's a lot of fear, there's a lot of anxiety. I pray that as your people, uh, we would be different, maybe even be peculiar in the middle of craziness, and uh, we would have peace. Uh, that people would look at and they say, I don't understand that. Uh, These people are acting different than everybody else. Uh, Lord, we just uh, lift up this church to you. Pray it continues 
uh, to do what you wanted to do and that every single one of us would glorify you with every single thing in our lives. And we'd make Jesus famous in Cumberland County, Tennessee. We love you. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, love you guys. We'll see you next week, hopefully.